And I, I think there's the thing that ties everyone together is their willingness to trust their kids mm. and, uh, you know, to, to, re to just question, question what the, the dominant culture says is the way to do things. And This is the Agentic Schools Podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg. Hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools Podcast. Um, I'm here with Cassie Clausen of The Open School uh, down in Santa Ana, California. Um, and Cassie, what I'd like to start with is tell me a story. Tell me about a student or a family that, ha that really um, sucked the marrow out of the experience you provide or what the opportunities that you provide. Somebody who really took advantage and, and really shined in, in just using your community as a place to learn. Um, okay, so you're going to make me choose one. Uh, so You can start with I, one, go to others. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. I mean, I always think about our kids that have been with us for the longest because, I, you know, the, the kids that are, you know, with us for seven, eight years get mm. so much out of it. Um, the process of becoming a self-directed learner doesn't happen in a year, you know, and, um, and the sooner that kids start and the earlier, the younger they are, the just the the faster they sort of jump in. So, um, so let's see, I'll tell you about a student who's still enrolled with us, um, mm -hmm. who joined us when I believe he was nine or 10, um, and is now 16. And, um, and he really came in, uh, as many, as many kids do excited about video games and, mm -hmm. and learning and, playing a lot with his friends and you know so many kids at that age are just they're surveying things they're mm. not becoming experts they're, but they just they play around and and that's so it's really hard to know what direction they're going to go right um, but this is a student who got very involved in our justice process and is um and has helped to kind of mold the way that we run um, what we call civics board. We are modeled mm. similarly to Sudbury Valley. Uh, so they call it JC. Um, but we, uh, so in the last couple of years, he and, and then also another friend of his, another great success story um, that I'm not gonna, I won't go into everyone's story, but <laughs> so they, the two of them, like he's running it, he's the chair um, of it and his friend who I believe will probably be an attorney one day, is um, the note taker, the clerk. He's the one that's the he's the expert of the rules and kind of um, you know kind of holds the precedent in his mind. Mm. He remembers how how we we do this last time, and um, so they've really helped to um, kind of drive forward our student directed justice process. And, and simultaneously for themselves, I think, learned and become um, really empathetic, compassionate people who, care, who, you know, who want, who see the benefit of holding boundaries and saying, like, mm. these are the rules of our community, but also um, we understand your learning. And we've, you know, they've been around long enough to see the success stories, to see the kids who really mm. struggled with those boundaries and are now leaders in the community and so they know this is a process and this child isn't just wrong all the time, you know, that, that mm. they're learning. So I've seen them grow a lot in, in maturity. Um, simultaneously, this child, the student, is also incredibly interested in science and so he has driven forward sort of our, our chemistry equipment purchasing and mm. he's been working with one of the staff on a regular basis doing um, different experiments. Uh, for the first time ever, the school meeting approved a school pet because hmm. he had he was the one who um, who put it forward and he takes so we have we have a mouse now we've had one for the past you know year or so and it's because this student who everyone was like okay we've we see that you've been responsible you have a real plan this isn't the first time we've had a student proposed school pet um, hmm. but the first time it was. Uh, approved because he actually 
clearly had thought through and um, and had a real reason for it mm. and, and was successful um, with this mouse this year. So um, anyway, so of course, it's he's one kid with a lot of variety of interests and and really becoming a leader in the community. And I still, you know, it doesn't mean I know where he's going or what it's going to end up doing. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. They, uh, so there's my success story that I'll tell yeah, you about. Yeah, that's very really cool. Um, so, so it's interesting because there's, there's, um, one of the things I, I briefly browsed your website a little bit, um, you know, before coming here and, 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 um, one of the things, and this is typical of Sudbury, uh, schools that take on this kind of Sudbury as a thing, as they say, we don't have a curriculum. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm always, um, a little skeptical of that claim, uh, because while you don't have an academic curriculum, what I would suggest is perhaps you have a social curriculum or a, mm -hmm. or a, you know, as you, you know, you have a civics board, so you have a, you have a civic curriculum. Um, right. would that be fair to say? Would the, does that fit with how you understand? What yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, um, you know, shy away from the word curriculum because it has such a specific meaning in our culture and uh, what people understand, mm -hmm. just like the word school does. In fact, we've gotten Right. Confusion just for the fact that we have the word school in our name. Um, but hmm. the uh, what? But you're right. What what we've done a lot of work on recently in the past couple of years is because we've just started graduating students for the first time, hmm. and so we did a lot of um, thinking about what what does it mean to be a graduate from the open school? What are the values that we hold that we hmm. are advocating for? Because that, yes, absolutely, there is, there is a message. There is something right. that we are passing on, and I guess you could call that a curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just not done in a very in that traditional the way we're gonna right. we're going to have a lesson plan and tell you all about it. But um, right. Right. yeah, so we have that's part of our diploma program is that we kind of have outlined. Here's what it what we want to see in graduates of the open mm -hmm. school. And if you're gonna get a diploma from us, you've at least encountered or had to deal with these kinds of values and these kinds of concepts. Um, and and the, yeah, the civic element of it, the fact that you are not, um, you know, I think sometimes the, the fallacy that can happen with students or kids who are raised in like a self-directed kind of model is um, entitlement and kind of mm. individualism that is, you know, so it's like, well, I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to. And that's the mm. attitude. And, and, and that we see that too, but trying to balance that with, but it, you're not by yourself. You're not just doing this. It's not all about you, that you're in a community. And so you have a civic responsibility. You have to understand how you impact other people. You have to mm. know that sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do because the outcome is desirable. And if that outcome is, you know, a community that thrives, a school where people want to be because mm -hmm. it's, you know, a, compa a compassionate, caring place. Um, right. We can't we can't litigate compassion, but yes. we can <laughs> certainly, um, you know, advocate for the fact that we're, you know, we're in this together. And that person, you might not like them. They might not be your best friend, but they have a right to be here just as much as you do. And mm -hmm. we have to figure out how to coexist and, and you know, be a benefit to our school that, that provides this space. So, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and th but that's, that's actually kind of the, I mean, exactly what you described as his, his and his friend's development was, was they developed these empathy and compassion and, and these, these, this sense of, you know, more than this is a bureaucratic process. I'm going to manage it. It's right. no, this is, this is about the relationships. This is about how we interact with each other. Um, and particularly in this very specific context of there's a conflict happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and that's what is brought to that board. Right. So, so, so yeah, I think it's really, um, you know, telling that, that when, when, when you describe what the, how someone who really dove into it, mm -hmm. what they got from it, what you observed as their development 
as part of that was was these very very interesting you know like like that's what we want even even a, a you know when they get older and they be, you know might get some bureaucratic type job but they're going to bring to it that sense of this is about people and this is about how we are together or something you know like like there's a bigger there's bigger values than just you know we're we're managing a system for adjudicating conflict we're actually right. doing something more now one thing that that um so in my experience i i uh, volunteered quite a bit at at the village free school in portland which is nearby mm -hmm. um and and one of the things that they did was they emphasized they're not they don't uh claim a sub to be Sudbury in any way um right. but but they still you know they had for years a very formal um uh i forget what they called it um, but, but, you know, a board, uh, you know, student run mm -hmm. with one uh, adult advisor who was mm -hmm. just available and, and, and present to be, you know, um, ensuring everything was working well. Um, but then, you know, their, their situation changed. They changed campuses several times, and so they've uh, let that go. Um, and, and go but, but, but the thing that they, they found was that they were handling things. They, they went from a large campus to a small campus. And they found that they just couldn't, nothing could wait for a board to meet. They just had mm -hmm. to deal with it because it, just, mm -hmm. it was just the nature of their situation. Mm -hmm. But they'd also laid the groundwork in, you know, uh, conflict resolution processes. And they actually had teenagers who were specifically trained in, in, in mediating conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so do you find that, that, that the, your, your civic board is is sort of second in line in terms of conflict resolution like like they that's later down the line that's only under certain circumstances is that, is that fair to say yeah i mean so i i want to first say that i think the um the justice process mm, experiment that all of us democratic schools are in i think it's i think it has to by necessity continue to evolve i think you have to con mm -hmm. always consider the community that you're in, your environment, the students you have, um, and ask on, on a fairly regular basis, is this working? Is this meeting its purpose? Is it doing mm -hmm. what we want it to do? Um, I think that it, you get into trouble if you just continue to do the same thing because mm. that's how, you know, Sudbury Valley does it or right. whatever, <laughs> and we're just supposed to do, that's the model, right? Um, it's been a big conversation within the Sudbury School community um, mm -hmm. is how the justice process functions and or doesn't and how to learn from other schools or, you know, um, philosophies and different and different things with without losing our ethos of student, you know, agency. Um, so what we've been doing a lot of that work as well so our our civics board process which still maintains the same name civics board as it has forever uh since we started ha like the actual process has shifted mm -hmm. we've included a lot more mediation steps okay. um and and then um one of the things that we I think our staff are really good at, and then it becomes something that other kids learn to do as well, is that in the moment problem solving. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what can we do before this reaches the, uh, the, you know, needing to be adjudicated by some sort of specific process, um, could sort of just communication. So yes, there are kids who write people up the first moment they get, you know, there's, <laughs> there's going to be kids who are just like, well, I'm going to take this to civics board, um, without even telling you, you know, without giving you an option and, and, and that's fine. And civics board is able to handle those. Um, mm -hmm. and those kids op often learn that like, oh, that wasn't as satisfying as I thought it might be. Um, mm. they, you know, I didn't get, they didn't get their comeuppance in the way I, that I wanted <laughs> them to, because, because it isn't about, punishment and it isn't a it's we've really shifted a lot towards um the civics board process being uh, in fact we call it a resolution plan the person mm -hmm. who was written up themselves is in, is really involved in deciding how to handle whatever the situation was whatever boundary they crossed how do they how do they address that um mm -hmm. and we're using language like that and language matters you know using words that instead of saying you know, are you guilty or not guilty? Um, mm. Or, 
you know, this is your sentence, so trying to use words that are more like, this is, you know, this is the boundary that was crossed. Do you agree? Do you see how you cross this boundary? Mm -hmm. um, what do you want to do about it? What's your resolution plan? That kind of stuff. We also do a discussion of impact. How did, hmm. how did this situation impact the, you know, the other person or the school at large or whatever it was? Um, but yeah, so, so it can be secondary. It can be complementary to sort of whatever else is going on. We've um, experimented with other things like a mediation committee with, hmm. again, with trained mediators in a similar way that it sounds like Village Free School has. Um, where someone could ask for a mediator in the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but you know, what happens is kids use the tools that they are familiar with and are aware mm -hmm. of. And, um, and civics board is very much one of those tools. Uh, but staff are, you know, we're pretty good about saying, like, do you want a mediator? Do you want to get, do you want to mm -hmm. get some help with the situation? Um, so they, so they start to know that that's available. Um, the other thing, shoot, I just, I had an idea and I just lost it. No. Never mind. I'll, <laughs> I'll come back to that later, I'm sure. Right but yeah, that's. Yeah, and one of the things that, that I find really interesting in the democratic education space is, um, is there are things that are either dangerous or controversial or otherwise, um, you know, independent of what people's attitude within the school is in the world are, you know, looked on like, hmm. Um, so what is your process for, uh, you know, sorry to, to put it in, in bureaucratic terms, uh, you know, like risk mitigation, like, like do you have um, like ways that kids qualify for those things or that there's a screening or how does that work? Um, do you mean just in general or specifically in the civics board or just? Oh, no, no, just in general, like, just, yeah, just things that, Like a you certification, know. we have certification okay. processes. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's really, it's interesting because there is, there are certain things that people would walk on our campus and sort of be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe a child is doing right. that. <laughs> but they don't see all of the other, you know, processes in place or the things that we pay attention to. We have, we have certifications for a lot of things that could be a little bit, you know, risky or, mm -hmm. um, you know, cutting with knives or cooking, or uh, we have a roller skating certification we put mm. in place because roller skating became popular again at our mm -hmm. on our campus, and people wanted to be able to roller skate. But then, you know, it, how do we do that safely? Um, so, because and of course that came after my own daughter broke her wrist uh -huh. <laughs> roller skating <laughs> on campus. Thankfully, it's almost sometimes I'm grateful that it's my child and not someone else's child. <laughs> right, right. But, um, you know, so those, kind of, those kinds of things. And then there's always, we also, when we go on field trips, for example, we're mm -hmm. pretty um, authoritarian <laughs> on field mm -hmm. trips, I'll say. You know, we're in, a, we're in someone else's space. The adults on the field trip, the chaperones, are responsible for what goes on. And so we, you know, put some clear boundaries in place and if people don't follow them then they might not be able to go on field trips and for a while mm -hmm. so um so there's a lot of those things that it's not like common sense is out the window you know when right, exactly. you have when you center you know child freedom and you you still care about their safety but we just don't want to do it in a way that's smothering um right. yeah so so we do we have we have a fair amount of put a lot of thought into those kinds of things um, right. And then right. also like on that with this, what you mentioned about not being able to wait sometimes for a committee to meet, you know, mm -hmm. for the justice process. Um, if we have a child that's acting, who's acting in a way that's like unsafe right now, we have a problem, then the staff have the authority to send that child home or to, you know, to mm -hmm. basically sit right next to them and can, you know, be kind of infringe on their autonomy until they can be picked up. So we mm -hmm. have had to do that a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know we're not gonna it's like well i'm gonna write you up that's gonna go to civics board tomorrow but right. when you're like <laughs> running around hitting someone with a stick you know like no you can't be here <laughs> if you if you're gonna do right. that right and and that's one of the things that i'm always curious about is it, it, so, so um when i first learned about uh, you know democratic schools and things i was kind of like oh you know that's interesting because uh, I, I I had um, homeschooled other people's kids myself, so I was basically running a consensus-run small group out of my home, um, and so 
it was interesting to find out that there were schools that actually did that bigger, you know, like uh, out of out of campuses. And and one of the things I, I actually ended up getting a, a job. Um, I was in a family whose son had been kicked out of a Sudbury school in the Bay Area. Um, and it was interesting because I was like, huh, okay. Um, it is one thing that people, as much as you talk about freedom and autonomy and things like that, is you do have boundaries. You do have ways to say, you know, no. <laughs> um, and knowing a kid who got kicked out, um, you know, it's like, yeah, there is a real important sense of, of how this works, and it has to work a certain way in that, you know, you, you have to say there's, a, you know, safety boundaries, respect boundaries, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's really interesting to me, like, for, for instance, you're saying, you, you mentioned that you guys have your first school pet. Um, and so it's, in, you know, thinking about, like, all those other times that it was proposed but not taken up. Right. You know, th like, share with people what that, what that, what, what would be the reasons why you're saying no to someone in that situation? Right. So that would be, you know, a school meeting proposal, uh, a student... Um, I mean, the one that comes to mind is um, maybe the maybe not a good example, but it's um, the one that I remember was a student who wanted to get a pet lobster for mm. the school, and um, and he was an older student, but not I think I think he was 13 or something at the time making the proposal, and he had done some research into it, um, and the you know there was. There's always the questions at school meeting. Well, who's going to take care of it on weekends? And how, what, what do you know about having a lot? Like, what does the cost? All of the things. Mm -hmm. And the students really have to do a lot of their own research. Um, I mean, since, since even this, though, I will say, as a parent, I have learned it's not really even enough for a kid to do research <laughs> into, right. into having an animal. I think they need to have had experience because... Um, you know, it's easy enough to research what do you feed a guinea pig and that kind of thing. It's a lot harder to actually clean the cage every week and, mm -hmm. you know, make the, the, all of those. So anyway, that might be something that I would bring next time we have a, a pet proposal. Um, but the, in this particular situation with the lobster, what ended up being brought up is we actually are on a campus. We right now lease from a Jewish temple mm. and the temple has a request for us to not bring any pork products or shellfish on campus. Mm -hmm. And so that was brought up at school meeting. I wonder if this violates the temple's no shellfish, <laughs> you know, uh, right, requirement. Right. And, and that was something that, you know, I, we were willing to ask the temple, but the students sort of said, oh, actually, maybe, maybe not. And I think also with the other questions of uh, what happens over the weekends and what where does this thing go in the summer? And how, it's not mm -hmm. a lobster in particular is not that transportable. Right. You know, you can the whole tank or something. So, but that's usually you know the conversations are just really going into depth of what what is it that um, what's your vision? And mm -hmm. the, uh, we had another one, a younger girl who wanted to do um, have a dog, you know. And mm -hmm. really, that's one of those where once you really dial down in, what is the vision? How does this work? Where does the dog sleep? How does you know all of those things? Um, they realize that they don't have a full, complete vision for it, and uh, mm -hmm. usually it's withdrawn or it's just voted down. Mm -hmm. um, if it was, if something like that was voted on, I mean, probably what would happen? Like, if, if it was voted for and the staff were all outvoted on it, um, it would probably fall apart in execution. <laughs> you uh, know, right, right. If, if uh, uh, it just maybe wouldn't actually totally happen because you would need um, you would need some staff help. So if something's not completely figured out like that, it's not the worst thing for mm -hmm. it to be approved because they'll still figure it out um, mm -hmm. in the process of, of trying to do it. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's always a, a, interesting. The the village free school I, it has a, a, a turtle. Or tortoise. I'm not sure uh -huh. which. Uh, um, uh, and so it's you know it's something they they they've worked that out. Uh, and they they actually had uh, um, fish tanks. They had a fish tank with an octopus in it. I mean they oh, wow. they had a lot of things yeah. for a while. Um, yeah. And then and then but it was but it was something where like the t the fish tank in particular um, is that they 
had a lot of enthusiasm for it. They had it for months, and then they then they said, okay, now it's time, and and you know it it wasn't a permanent thing. The tur turtle, I think, is. I think they still have that. Uh, actually, I should check in with them. Um, yeah. But but yeah, it's, it's interesting how those things evolve. Um, yeah, and if you have a staff member, you know, who has particular enthusiasm for something, and right? That's fine, you know. Um, it, but um, if there's not, if none of the staff right. are that interested in having it, then the kids really have to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, and and, and a tortoise is something that lives for a very long time. Yeah. So so we actually at, at our we're, I li I live in West Lynn, which is just south of Portland. And I live in a llama ranch, um, but okay. one of the things we have is we have a little atrium that has, has a 50 year old tortoise in it. You know, wow. it's like <laughs> you know, yeah, that tortoise is like you know, it's a big commitment. Um, yes. And so yeah, you have to have somebody using it. And I know that that for village free school is that the he had a very uh you know big kind of big cage but he he was more portable than a lobster for sure um, right and so he went to various people's houses i think at, at different times mm -hmm. um yeah so so tell me a little bit about um the open school like like um who do you see showing up for your school like who are the student who kind of the demographics the community the things like that like who who how does it how does uh, who does the open school attract? How would you describe them? Um, you know, I, so our, first of all, where we live in Orange, Orange County, just as a kind of a bit of a background, is a, um, a very, it's, it's about an hour away from LA, uh, for anyone who doesn't know California geography. And, um, and it is a pretty, um, high demographic, like economically um, part of the state, um, generally on the more conservative end. Um, mm. And which is sort of what, you know, it's funny when, when I wanted to start the school here, I just, I definitely had some people who were, were like, I don't know if you have the people and, you know, who in Orange County that just, see, it's such a, it's a little bit more of a conservative pocket here. And, uh, you know, but what I found is, well, with, with anywhere, anywhere, I think when you have a, a dominant culture, you always have a, a subculture mm -hmm. and you, and, um, and it's not that all of the people who come are politically liberal. It's more, I'm, I'm more talking about way of life, right? So yep. the people who come to our school, who are attracted to our school are just, they're, they're people who are willing to, to question the status quo and, Many of them, when they were kids, or um, you, you know, when they first had children, were just like, I just know I don't want my child to be in a traditional school. I don't know exactly what that means. I just know that that I don't believe in that. I don't yeah. necess I don't buy in. So, what are the options? Got to be something else. And then they start to do the research. Um, some of them don't entirely get there until their child has some kind of crisis. You know, right. they maybe they did a political or a public, a public school for a while. And then it but in the back of their head, they're like, I, I don't like putting my kid here. But what else are you going to do? And mm -hmm. then a crisis comes up and that really pushes them to uh, rethink um, what what their assumptions are. But I would say a majority of them were never really bought into the conventional school system in the first place. Um, and, and so they just, they've kind of wanted, they're just looking for something that, um, that aligns with their values. Yeah. And, um, you know, so demographically it doesn't, it, it doesn't seem to be exactly the same type of people, you know, that we have people from all different ideology backgrounds, different economic backgrounds, racial, ethnic backgrounds, um, I will say self-directed um, or alternative schools tend to be uh, more of a white space. I'm sure this is not news to anybody, okay. but um, it's great. We are seeing more diversity there. And, uh, but I you know, have these conversations with our families who come in that are people of color and they say, they you know, ask about the demographics of the school and we talk about how it's kind of a white space. And, you know, but, like that's not what we want, <laughs> you know. It's great right. to have more people who are who are questioning um, the and and who have this space for them. So we don't, our our student demographics are becoming more diverse um, every year, mm -hmm. and um, 
yeah, I mean, I, I think there's the thing that ties everyone together is their willingness to trust their kids mm. and, uh, you know, to, to, re to just question, question what the, the dominant culture says is the way to do things. And, and I do think, um, this is something I believe at an Aero conference, if you, when I went, I think it was in 2015, mm -hmm. is that right? No, 2012, I don't know, 2012, it was in Oregon. Okay, yeah, in Portland. And I remember um, there, was a, there was a workshop about uh, millennial parents. Mm. And, and so this, yeah, so I'm, it was in 2012. And I remember actually meeting some people from Village Free School at that. Yeah. But um, this workshop about millennial pa parents, it was like, these, this, the millennial parents are our parents. Like, they're going to be questioning conventional and they, look at this is how old they are. This is how old their kids are. And we're going to see in about five years, they're going to start having kindergartners and and, you know, here it is, I guess, 11 years since going to that workshop. And I, and I see that to be true. That seems to be mm. borne out. So, so the, you know, I do, we're getting more of those millennial parents with younger kids who are now making up a big bulk of our new families. They don't need to have a crisis. They already can tell mm. I, I'm, I'm not putting my child in public school. So we got to do something else. So, so what is your capacity as a school? Uh, and, and how close are you to it? <laughs> so in our current campus, our capacity is about 50 on-campus students. We also have a virtual right. um, program. So that doesn't, you know, it's that capacity is limited by staffing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and also we don't want to just suddenly explode. We need to kind of slowly in, uh, enroll people. But, but that's just sort of, that's kind of, uh, new frontier. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're asking ourselves, well, what does it look like when there's 100, 200, 500 students, you know, in a virtual program? Where do, do we have to section or do they self section or how does this, what does this look like? We don't know. So, uh, <laughs> right now we have about 35 in our virtual program. We have about 45 in our on campus. Um, and we are in the process of purchasing a campus for 2024. So, oh, and the vision with that would be, um, a, you know, a max of probably, probably 85 to 100 students. That's it kind of depends. We have a building in mind, which is a little smaller actually than our original like vision, but it's a really cool building. That would be amazing if we get it. So we're kind of willing to, to, you know, cap it, cap our student population at more like 85. Mm. If we were to write our own, I mean, like, get exactly what we wanted, we'd probably be going to, you know, um, 100, 120. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've, we kind of surveyed our parents, especially, and they really don't want a school that's much bigger than that. That's kind yeah. of um, what they feel like is sort of like, maybe even a little big for them. They really like the fact <laughs> that we, they have like, oh, 40 students here feels like a nice, safe number. Um, but yeah, that's that we are, we are growing and we are looking at for having a probably a wait list for the first time this nice. year for on campus, which is great in preparation of that yeah, move. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so, so you're in California and mm -hmm. um, are there any uh, ways that, that you see um, regulations or anything? Is there anything that you, that you feel like, um, like your interactions with the the bigger picture sort of regulatory mm -hmm. agencies, insurance, and you know, whatever the different kind of outside supports that you need or outside things that could impinge on you. Do you mm -hmm. feel like there's any, any um, you know, kind of things you are concerned about or that, that, that might be looming for you or of concern? Um, um, you know, surprisingly, no. Um, with California having a reputation, an earned reputation of being highly regulated, um, mm -hmm. it's surprisingly not too um, overbearing on private schools and homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and at this point, the only, the things that they've really been focused on in the last few years has been things like um, vaccinations and uh, 
uh, medical, like there's certain things that they've been trying to close loop, a lot of loopholes um, mm. uh, for, for required vaccinations. And so that's coming to the private schools, but you know, that um, is different than, you know, are they gonna suddenly make us do standardized testing or, <laughs> um, you know, that kind of thing. So at this point, um, it's, there haven't, it hasn't come up on my radar that there okay. there've been, I, I think getting started, um, mm -hmm. the hard part was getting, it was hard to get insurance, mm -hmm. uh, liability insurance, or is that the right word? Uh, the, basically the biggest thing was they asked us how many field trips we take uh -huh. and our first, <laughs> and our first year we were taking a lot and we still do take a f much more than, you know, a traditional school might take right. one a semester. And, and we're going sometimes two a week, you know? Mm -hmm. So the insurance companies don't love that. Right, um, right. But uh, yeah, other than that, um, you know, it's, I don't see a lot of issues with the regulations yeah. so yeah. much. There's a lot, you know, a lot of people just don't understand. I, oh, I guess the other, the other place that's tricky is as we are getting ready to purchase a property, one, we have to, we're gonna be uh, applying for conditional use permit. Yeah to be a school and you know, a conditional use permit to be a school is, is written in a very specific, you know, what a school is in mind. And so we're gonna, we just have to change our definitions really, you know, like what, <laughs> where's the classroom, which ones are, where's the cafeteria, that kind of thing. Oh, right. Like we don't necessarily use the building that way, um, but it's, it's not gonna uh, be something, I don't believe that will stop us, we just have to, we just have to work within the confines of their language. Right, right. That's one of the things. I, so, um, you know, I've been kind of in, in talking to people in this, like I've been, I've been to each of the arrows in Portland and, and a variety of other conferences and been in touch with people. So, so one of the interesting things I find is that um, the most successful people in, in this arena are the ones who develop a relationship with whoever they need to be having a relationship with, which may be your insurance mm -hmm. provider, or maybe like, I think Village Free School was even having interesting conversations with the fire marshal, or maybe that mm -hmm. was, anyway, there's Wayfinding Academy or Wayfinding College, which recently closed down, um, mm -hmm. was also one where they, they, as an alternative, had carved out a niche in, in this space between high school and college. Um, they ended up actually offering an AA degree, um, okay. but but that was you know that was kind of like an outcome of their conversation with the accreditation body was you know we have to have something so we'll do that and and mm -hmm. so they made it actually an optional process um, but it was interesting because they they really took several years of having back and forth conversation because they want to do something very alternative. Um, they kind of are very well aware of, of the, the many possibilities for operating in interesting ways. Um, but once they got a campus and then they really were saying, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Um, it mm -hmm. came back to, you know, like they had to actively negotiate with this, this body who'd never done anything outside of like, they technically were a community college, but most of what they, no one, most people wouldn't recognize it as such. Um, mm -hmm. Even if that's their legal designation, it's not necessarily how like like you at you know, yes you're a school, but the, you know right. what does the legal designation? What is the zoning? What is the you know like what are the fire right. regulations? You know there's all kinds of interesting things that then you have to say, okay yeah we have school in our name, however, <laughs> and, right. and here's how we actually operate or here's what we you know sure will and, and there's that sort of disconnect between what does the bureaucracy require as a mm -hmm. language? You know, yes you have to have a classroom. But that's right. not necessarily what you mean by, you know, <laughs> well, right, that right. space. Um, so it's really yeah. interesting, and 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 it, you know, it, it is fascinating to me um, how people have these conversations within their community. I mean, it, I mean, you, I'm sure you have the conversation with parents as well, as sort of like, what are we doing? What are we up to? And if they haven't heard of, if they're not already familiar, then there's sort of a challenge around. And and I'd be interested. What is your kind of pitch to people unfamiliar with democratic education? Do you have a particular way of talking about it and framing it? Um, yeah, so, and, and I actually, you know, I'm going through this process right now and building these relationships with people in the city that were, you know, um, the planning department and all of that. And, and I really, um, 
I talk about it being a, a very individualized, uh, bespoke boutique kind of school. If I'm not trying to sell, I'm not trying to talk to a parent into enrolling, right? So that's a different right. conversation. Yeah, but just trying to explain, you know, that it's, um, you know, we're we're a school. Of, you know, a lot of kids who um, maybe they they would struggle in a conventional school, and they have their own unique way of doing things and their own path. And we want to support everyone, every kid's path. Um, I, uh, you know, might provide them examples of, you know, things that our kids like to do that sound very um, impressive. You know, there's right. <laughs> those of us in, in this world are like, I don't, whatever, if you go into video game design or be, go to MIT, I don't care, like whatever, you, it's cool. Um, but we're going to tell, we're going to put those like impressive stories. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I really kind of um, lean on the in like the uh, support for the individual child, and that we mm -hmm. and so that means we don't have a kind of a traditional school space. It's much more like a large home where you might find a number of different or different kinds of. The other thing would be like different studio kinds of spaces. Maybe mm -hmm. this is this is the art studio space and the music studio and the science space, and we have these different kinds of spaces uh, because. And, and, and students can take advantage of any of these kinds of things because we are, you know, crafting an individual educational experience um, mm -hmm. for them. And so that's kind of where I go <laughs> for, right for, for those um, kind of city officials and they and people get really inspired. I mean, and the other thing is, is, um, you know, I think sometimes we can feel apologetic or a little bit like. Mm slightly embarrassed about what, you know, I don't, um, I, I want to, I want to be in a mindset of being really proud of my school and what we do and how we have these, you know, this, we provide this incredible experience for these kids who could get this nowhere else. Not, I mean, they would have to move, right? They, right. if it, so this is so unique and this kind of a school does not exist very in very many places. Um, but we can provide this space for for these really special kids and they you know might they would be underserved in any other school you know and we can um really give them an incredible educational experience and so yeah that's that's yeah. sort of how i put it <laughs> usually and and when you are recruiting a parent how does that shift mm -hmm. like what is the focus when you're when you're recruiting a parent um, so I talk a lot and I'll, this is, so I have some talking points. One is that we give, um, we treat every kid with dignity, trust and respect that it all is we, the message that we want the kids to have is who you, who you are matters, period. So what you care about matters, period. I'm not going to judge that you like anime and that's not, that's a waste of your time because if you like anime, and you are you are important that anime is important you know so that's uh that's the kind of uh, language and then I talk about how everything that our school does all of the um uh activities field trips classes or workshops if they have you know what that they come about they do rarely um those are all student initiated they're not from a staff member or a parent or mm -hmm. something crafting it for them they're student initiated now a staff might come alongside and support and help but we don't drive the the bus um and um talk about how freedom includes risks but mm -hmm. we see that in a small community a small caring community those risks are really mitigated so you you might have a risk of you know skinning your knee or bumping your head but you know things like systemic bullying and you know, serious concern, safety concerns. We don't have those. We see them too quickly. Like if, if something if something looks like a bullying situation, it's it's alerted. Um, it's easy for us to see and to address and to spend time in. So even though there's a risky amount of you know there's a risk element to freedom, there's this is like this is the safest place you know to experience those risks because right. you're also within people who you're with people who care about you. Um, Talk about age mixing. Um, I think mm -hmm. the age mixing is the is a magic secret ingredient. Um, <laughs> I know I, at least when I first started learning about Sudbury schools, I, the age mixing wasn't the the headline. Um, right. So, but it's just it's part of it's part of the model. It's part of how we do things. And 
Uh, and I know Village Free School has age mixing in, but it's seg- yep. like there's certain groups. But still, like having kids who are not all exactly the same age at the exact same place developmentally, they learn from each other. They're not, you know, being they're not competing against each other. You don't have to try right. to be the best ten year old in the room. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you are. And a lot of our kids don't even know the age of the other students. Sometimes they don't realize yeah. that their their friend that they hang around with and play with is three years older than them or two years younger because they just get along and they don't, it doesn't matter, you know? Right. Um, so, so those are some of the things that I talk about when, when recruiting and then when actually enrolling, we talk about some of the hard things too. So I yeah. kind of have two different conversations. I have the one that's more inspiring and that's about, um, yeah, about treating your kid with dignity and respect and because they're a human being and we treat them as one and then they, the possibilities are endless. We never know what path they're going to take, and that's exciting. And then when they're enrolling, we talk about, you know, things like video games and, Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, Mm -hmm. you know, um, maybe learning some new swear words and stuff like that. that Right, right, right. (laughs) And, you know, some of those those other things. Yeah. So 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 just since it's it it came up, like what how has your community been uh, uh, on the, the video game? Like what, what decisions have Mm. been made and, and, you know, how has it evolved over time? Um, so we definitely tend more, um, I guess, libertarian, I guess in that, in that sense, um, with video games, um, it, it's not video games. I think actually is probably not the question. It's really more about other screens and social yeah. media is the, the, the hardest thing. Mm. I think video games has now been something that everyone sort of accepts and sees all the benefits to and are like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> we don't have to worry about video games. Um, what sometimes is harder is like teenagers sitting around on their phones and just scrolling for hours mm. or, um, uh, you know, younger kids even who normally would be playing and building forts together you know, on their iPads instead. And, um, and that can sometimes feel that can feel really alarming as an adult walking right. through a community. Um, we, we've gone through, we've gone through different like, uh, places where like the f- community was more alarmed about something and then sort of had conversations and then felt a little bit more comfortable with it. Um, I think it's hard to tell how much of that alarm is just coming straight from adults. And, but there's, you know, we, last year, or maybe it's actually been about a year and a half now, we did have, um, we had one of our students who is a younger student and was getting tired of coming to school and his friends were playing on their computers or whatever instead of playing with him. And so he made a school meeting motion to ban personal devices. And mm. that, as you can imagine, had a lot of <laughs> a lot of people showing up to school meeting. Um, that you know, the first time that that's happened, where a student made something like us, uh, maybe not the first time, but you know, uh, it ha- it's been a long time since a student made that kind of emotion. Um, but what that did was incite a big conversation about why he felt the need for this motion and what are some solutions. And then we had a task force called the cultural impact of personal devices task force that had a few different, you know, um, we did like, uh, what's that called when you have a small, a focus group, a few kind of Mm. focus group conversations with different age groups to sort of talk about it. And it really, I think some of the students just appreciated, like, especially in the teenagers, this is maybe where I'm thinking, you know, there were teenagers who felt bothered that their friends were kind of just scrolling on their phones all day and they mm-hmm. just felt like they weren't available um, or engaging. And I think they just appreciated the ability to open that conversation because they mm-hmm. maybe didn't have that uh, opportunity before. And it's, I'm not going to say it changed everything or, you know, <laughs> I think we talked about different solutions or different ideas and having, what if we had a, you know, a phone like, um, jail box where it's oh, yeah. not it's optional you can decide like hey i just i just need my phone to be away from me i'm just going to put it there i know where it's at and i'll just something like that and we've had and we also have had other things like um we have something called thursday circle it's whatever day circle um where it's a intentional just like invitational time for people to come and there's a prompt 
and it might be silly, we might play a game or it might be like a little bit more serious. And it's like a 30 minute time, time spot for people to have connections with people that aren't in their peer group. And, you know, so we talked about like, well, that's kind of, that wasn't intending to, to be non, like a, another, something that's not technological, but it, it is, mm. you don't bring your phone to it. Um, you know, are there other kinds of community events like that, that we could do? We talked about those things, nothing was ever implemented. And, you know, I think people have sort of kind of gotten to a place where they're less bothered. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I th we see that where it comes, it becomes a topic of conversation in the community for a while, and then it kind of reintegrates and, um, you know, and, and we're kind of back to, well, we, we all have this uh, relationship with technology, it's not going away. And, um, you know, we get to decide how we, how we want to have that, so. Right, right. And that, that, that to me seems, speaks volumes to, um, you know, the, 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 the values you're communicating are not, um, uh, you know, about the technology per se. What you're right. communicating is a value of when, we, when a concern comes up, the youngest person in the room has equal power to the oldest person in the room to say, here's my concern and let's address it. Um, mm -hmm. and, that, and, that, and that one, you know, the value of enabling anybody, everybody to have that power is that, you know, sometimes somebody voices something and it turns out it's, a, it's, it's an issue for the whole community. It's something people were bubbling mm -hmm. with in some way and, then, and now here's the opportunity. Um, and, and, and that's, I think, one of the beauties of, of an agentic school um, mm -hmm. is that the, the facilitation of agency is the central, uh, is a central aspect of it. And, and so, and so the, the challenge is to be in the dialogue of, oh, who am I? Who are you? How are we together? How are we in this community? What is this community? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and you're in a unique position uh, as someone who represents it to the outside world. Um, who who you know recruits people into it um, in a very intentional way, um, um, but that you know it really is about that um, process of dialogue. Uh, you know that that it's a it's a, a caring community that really is. Oh. Speaking of devices, in there, <laughs> I, I almost know. never have the ringer on, but you know, there we go. yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's really um, interesting to to think about, you know, what, what the video game happens, you know, video game, but screens um, and, and technology is is just happens to be one that gets a lot of people's attention. Um, and, and every community, I, you know, every school that I've talked to and, and brought that up with um, has a different set of, you know, circumstances, a different set of, you know, things they've considered and done. And, you know, at the Village Free School, they came up with a whole process of, you know, you know how they have, uh, like movies have ratings and games have ratings. Mm -hmm. Well, not all games actually have a rating, but they created right. a whole panel to generate ratings for their things. Yeah. And then they have all certifications around who gets to play which kind of games. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's fascinating because I remember being in the space and 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 um, and there were there there was these challenges of what happens if younger kids who are not certified for the type of game you're playing who's responsible for like is it the teen's responsibility to shut it down so that the kid isn't exposed to it is it the kid's right. responsibility you know and so then there's all these conversations that happen right. and it's not it actually in in a sense doesn't matter what decision you make it's the fact that of right. how you go about making the decision and that everyone's involved and that that you know these just details of like yeah if we if we go by certification and have have it by grading and all that then then there's things that follow on that there's there's things that right. have to happen um, right. so 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 i find that really fascinating uh, and that's also why you know ask about things like certification and things like that uh, now, do you guys have um, when when somebody has an interest, like you know, having a mouse or whatever? Um, do you do sort of like I think I think Sudbury calls them corporations. Do you have ways of mm -hmm. kind of doing yeah. a similar kind of process? 
Right. Yeah. So we do we do have co-ops. Um, co-ops. Okay. Our, yeah. We and we did call them cor- corporations until a few years ago and changed it to co-ops. Um, nice. <laughs> but it is. Um, I would say they're not super used right now uh, for a while. I think uh, generally because I think people see a need for co-ops when um, maybe when when a material doesn't exist, when we don't have the stuff. Mm. Um, You don't have to join a co-op to use, you know, art materials. You don't have to be in the art co-op. But you if you want to decide what art materials we have or how to manage them, then you're on the art co-op. So Mm. if the materials exist and there's already sort of a culture around managing them, there's not too much of a need. So we see co-ops when there's a new interest. We had, you know, a Mm. camera co-op for a little while where someone was interested in photography, but wanted needed to get some, you know, um, some, some stuff for it and it needed to Mm. be ongoing. Some things aren't ongoing either. They're just, I want to get this one thing, and that's all I want. I, it doesn't need to be a whole thing. I just um, so we also have something called resource committee that has money put aside for for that for student requests. Mm-hmm. Um, so they can just decide, um, or they can ask. You know, uh, we had students or a student asked for a board game. You know, mm-hmm. hey, there's this board game I really like. I think the school should have it. I'm gonna put in a resource committee request and say why it's important and why it's a great game and that kind of thing. Um, so we see more use of that right mm. now than we have in co-ops, uh, but we'll see. You know, again, we we do have that structure there, right? Um, and you know, it kind of there's so much about being a democratic school that's like fits and starts and you know waves <laughs> and you know things are uh, field trips are like that too, where yeah. there will be a lot of interest in field trips. And we go on tons of field trips for a few weeks and then they peter off and no one. It's like people forgot that field trips even exist and they do it, you know, until like it starts up again. And so mm-hmm. so we see that with a lot of different of these different kind of mechanics of the school. Yeah. And that that's one of the things that I find, you know, that, that I think is the you, age mixing and and those dynamics, those that that changeability is the fact that the school organization is kind of defined by we're going to follow mm-hmm. those waves or we're going to, you know, we're going to allow those waves to come and go and, mm-hmm. and we're not going to, you know, attach ourselves to some particular thing um, mm-hmm. except for the decision-making process and the conflict resolution process. Those, those things, there has to be some version of that. They, even then they will change how they work occasionally or, you know, over time. But but they they those are the central things that we are committed to having exist, and right. and 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 so that's the that's what you know those couple of things age mixing, you know dynamic resources resolve conflicts right. and make decisions you know <laughs> right um, right yeah and and that's that's also the challenge of it right is because it is you know there's there's a few core things and then and then you have to roll with a lot of other stuff going on yeah um, yeah so so. Let's let's finish where we started. Give me one more story um, about you know m- maybe you know a student, a staff, you know somebody who really uh, you know presented a challenge and and grew from it, or or you know that that went in a direction that might have been unexpected or just was was cool. <laughs> um, okay, so okay, well uh, the I guess this is. I don't think it's too similar to my first story, but um, this is another student who's, who has been with us for a long time and he just graduated this last year. So he was one of our first graduates. We just had our first class nice. um, this year. So he came to us when he was 11 and, um, and spent a lot of time playing video games, but a lot of time walking around the school and, and quoting memes and movies that's kind of what he would do <laughs> walk into a room and say something sort of outlandish and he likes he he he's liked to have the center of attention and um he got himself suspended a few times mm-hmm. um he had uh he had sort of um he had unfortunately he had just lost his mother mm-hmm. um the summer before he enrolled with us and you know had had some amount of 
living with different family members and then hit, and then moved in with his dad and that's when he started enrolling with us and and I you know I think he had a lot of exposure to you know, at 11 he, he was on the young side for some of the things that he knew about mm -hmm. um, and so he wasn't necessarily responsible or a responsible party like he would he would do things and he would expose things to you know other people and um, and we were a little unsure that he would make it and we thought um, we might have to ask this child to leave because he was, you know, bringing in some, um, and some elements that were um, felt unsafe mm. um, for younger kids. So there is something that Sudbury schools have. Um, we haven't used it in a long time, but we, but at the time we leaned pretty heavily on a, a indefinite suspension, mm. and so that's a that is a you know, a suspension that does not have an end. Some people think it's an expel expulsion, but it's not. Um, it ends when the student, so the student then comes back to school meeting and kind of makes a case to school meeting about why they're ready to be back in school, mm. what they, you know, what they understand about the suspension, what, you know, why it happened and, you know, what they learned and everything. And um, this can be a really powerful uh, experience for kids. Uh, or it could be the end of enrollment, yeah, you know, depending on how it goes. So, so this student was indefinitely suspended, um, and I can't remember the exact reason for it, but he, it wasn't his first suspension. You know, he had had mm. other suspensions, and then this was like, hey, are you really going to, do you want to be here or not? you mm -hmm. you got to pull this together. And that really was a turning point for him. So, um, you know, he came back. For, it's not that everything was smooth sailing from then on, but because of his, you know, he loved... He, he was he was um, charismatic. Uh, mm. The other kids would follow him, you know, it, it follow his lead. And so I had a number of conversations with him about his role in the school and the way that he really impacted other people. And um, and that's a big responsibility and to consider how he wants to use that. And um, anyway, so, you know, fast forward a few years later, he's he became and he never stopped being a leader in that way mm -hmm. people always were drawn to him he's he's in he's totally unpredictable which <laughs> as a staff member it may it's like really stressful when you're given a parent you know uh tour and you're like what's what's he gonna say mm -hmm. um so but he you know became a little bit more controlled with some of that and just really funny and uh really well liked and then um and then, you know, his interests led him, his interest in movies and storytelling and things like that, he led him towards animation. Hmm. And he um, has been working for years on uh, different, he, he's a storyteller. So he would, he, he has all of these different stories that he's working on at any one time, but he had a specific story that he's been working on for probably three or four years. And he has... Um, you know, written scripts and it, it, he made it into an episodic series. I think he has like 10 or 13 episodes and he's written the scripts and he's, you know, animating them and taught himself um, Blender, which mm -hmm. is, a, you know, 3D animation and in the process realized that school computer wasn't strong enough. So he had to, you know, he asked for permission and got money to rebuild or to rebuild a new computer that would be able to handle what he wanted to do. He said he probably did that two or three times actually mm. over the course of his, him being at the school. Um, and, and, you know, and then that's what his, um, he did go through our diploma program, which includes a capstone project. And his capstone project was the, uh, an animated trailer for his series. Mm. So, you know, cause he's been in the works for so, so long, but he's, he get you know, he gets really, he changes the story and he, <laughs> but, but putting together a trailer, even a two minute trailer is a really, an animated trailer is a really big project. And so he completed that and he's still working on, you know, he graduated, he's still working on that. That's something. Mm. Um, and he messaged me after, he messaged me a couple of weeks after graduation and he, you know, he said, Hey, if you ever need a volunteer, if you want me mm. to come be on campus and hang out with the kids while you guys do a field trip or, you know, if you ever need anything, like he, he really, um, Ha, like he went from being a kid that we really didn't know <laughs> if he would stay after his first year to, you know, someone who maybe in a few years could, we could see hiring, you know, he's wow. um, yeah. a, a really, 
but I hope that I honestly, I'm like, I hope that he doesn't because he has such a big future. I don't want him to work <laughs> out of school. I want him to like go into film, you know, go that direction. But anyway, so. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent example. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Well, let, let's we, uh, wrap it up here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, where should people go to find out more, to explore and see Yeah, so people? our website is openschooloc.com. Um, that's the best place to, you know, find out how to connect with us and everything. Um, social media, we, we go through, you know, periods of being active and periods of not. So, uh, you know, email is going to be the best way to get in contact, email or phone call, and great. the website's the best place. All right, yeah. great. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and thanks, John. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop.